Uh, hi and welcome everyone. Deepa is getting the, the text ready. Um, we're going to lead off with a, a video, but first welcome to this session, Leveraging Social Procurement to Create Change with a, an all-star panel, um, who we will introduce in a second. Um, and uh, keep in mind, if you can, video on, mute on for the time being. And if you have questions and as they come up, please toss them in the chat. If you have things you want to learn, please toss them in the chat. <laughs> By now, I think we all know the, the, Zoom, the Zoom meeting drill. Uh, and then if you're interested in what you've seen, um, come in and join us in Catalyst, in particular, the private sector working group. Um, over to you, Deepa. Catalyst 2030 started life as a WhatsApp group among social entrepreneurs, connecting to envision real transformational change. Launched at the World Economic Forum in January 2020, it's grown into a global movement accelerating change to ensure the SDGs are reached by 2030. Fueled by passion, our 550 members working in 175 countries have collectively put in an amazing 50,000 volunteer hours to touching the lives of two billion people. And we're driven by values to which we hold ourselves accountable. 2020 was a busy year, co-creating three reports with partners and producing one of our own, inviting high level guests to participate in the Catalyzing Change campaign, hosting fireside chats and expert hours, which we'll be continuing in 2021. To celebrate our achievements, together we placed our supporters in the limelight with the first Catalyst 2030 Awards for Systemic Change. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, we celebrated finalists and winners in the following categories. Special recognition for our early supporters, individual philanthropists, donor organizations, philanthropic intermediaries, corporate organizations, by a multilateral organization, some four regional winners in the category of national governments. And now on to Catalyzing Change Week 2021. During this social entrepreneur-led event, we bring together diverse stakeholders in over 100 sessions to showcase their systems change efforts and the best practices that can accelerate our work in pursuit of the SDGs. Thanks, Deepa, and welcome everybody. My name is Dan Biederman, and I am associated with a venture capital for labor rights firm, a mission-oriented impact investing venture firm called the Working Capital Fund. And I am your, your proud moderator for the day. Uh, I'm also the chairman of, or the coordinator of the private sector working group within Catalyst. So those of us in the private sector working group, working group seven, um, are trying to figure out how better to bring the private sector into relationship with social enterprises, and social entrepreneurs to achieve the SDGs. Uh, if that interests you, uh, either now or especially at the end of this event, um, please let us know and feel free to join us. Uh, this conversation with these wonderful three distinguished panelists is going to focus on social procurement. We're going to find out, first of all, what is it, if those of you who don't know, but then most importantly, we're going to figure out how social enterprises and social entrepreneurs can potentially access social procurement, specifically contracts from multinationals uh, and from governments that have at their core, not only the desire to procure um, goods and or services, but also to achieve some sort of social outcome. This group is uh, particularly well suited to having this conversation. I'm gonna ask each of them just to give a brief 30 second, where are you in your organization and what is it that you focus on before we get into the meat I'm going to start with you, Alex Vanderplug from SAP, Head of Global Corporate Responsibility. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's a pleasure being with everybody today. Um, as Dan said, my name is Alex, Alexander Vanderplug. I head up Corporate Social Responsibility at SAP, a um, fairly large tech company um, based in, uh, in Europe. Um, but I, but a, a global player with about 440,000 customers across the globe. Um, there's always one statistic I like to mention about SAP because it sort of shows the magnitude of the company. 77% of all 
transactions that happen in the business world um, pass a SAP system at one point or another. That's pretty, pretty impressive. And I think for those of you, for the chocolate lovers amongst you, I think about 80% of the world's chocolate is um, also hits an SAP system in one way or another at some point. Um, um, I, you know, we, we have a very strong focus on social entrepreneurship um, and since about two years in social procurement, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but I'm just happy to be here with everybody and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, particularly for those of us who love chocolate to know just the vital, the vital role you play in the global chocolate economy. Next, we'll turn to Alexander Tarmo from uh, Unilever, Head of Partnerships and Social Procurement. Likewise, a sort of a quick introduction and situate yourself in the, in the Unilever world and the economy. Yeah, also very happy to be here. So um, yeah, so I'm Alex Tarmo, uh, I'm at Unilever. I'm, I'm part of procurement. I, I have in my title something called Social Procurement, which is very new and I'm very proud of. Uh, and, and we can talk a bit more about, about that later. Uh, that's why I'm here. Of course, Unilever, in the video, I saw the 2 billion and, and you all know that Unilever is, is having the pleasure of having 2 billion consumer every day using our product. So when we talk about impact, we have clearly a big, big role we can play. Very happy to be here today. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Um, and last but certainly not least, Jerry Higgins, who's the founder and chair of the Social Enterprise World Forum, and we'll, we'll, would love an introduction from you, Jerry, and then we'll start with a, a question to you, which I'll hold in abeyance for just a moment. So tell us. Cool. Thanks, Dan, and uh, good, to, good to be with you. Um, I'm Jerry Higgins. I'm the founder and managing director of Social Enterprise World Forum. I'll refer to that as SEWF from here. And we were established in 2008 to grow and strengthen the international social enterprise movement. And we've been doing that since 2008. And I think you would struggle to find uh, um, a better contrast of the scale in relation to Unilever and SAP with our small but mighty team of six uh, based in five countries. Um, and I'm in the West of Scotland. Uh, wonderful. And you're in the West of Scotland, particularly because you're on a bike trip and you're, you're despite the fact that you had an exhausting day on the bike, you're, you're joining us nevertheless. So grateful. And, and we'll stay with you. Uh, and welcome to those of you who've joined since we did the opening. Um, we're going to find out what is social procurement? How is it useful? And if you're in the social enterprise, social entrepreneurship space, you're going to find out how you can access it and what you should understand about it to improve the, the performance of your own business. But Jerry, start us off. What is, what is, what is, what is social procurement? What do we need to know about it? Is it adequately well defined? Do we need to worry about a definition, or are we all pretty clear? And 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 why why are you interested in supporting social procurement? Okay, um, I think anyone who's interested in a definition is probably better listening to the conversation, engaging with the conversation to to work out what's happening um, uh, here here tonight, and 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 look at what it can mean for them rather than starting with uh, with a. a, a technical overview and you know for me when I was working in social enterprise in the UK in the 90s and holding workshops one of the biggest barriers to social enterprise um, uh, progressing as a, as a type of business was the absence of social of procurement opportunities many companies if if uh, if a social enterprise tendered and it had a particular legal structure it wasn't considered it, it was it was the only structures that were deemed suitable uh, for procurement with either governments or or, or with with corporates uh, were, um, were were private structures and corporate structures so um in the uh, late now in, in the early 2000s um uh, some pilot projects started um uh, to look at how social enterprises um uh, could be part of corporate and public sector supply chains and we were involved from 2008 um uh, working with canadian colleagues um, from the uk to canada and particularly scotland where i'm based uh, looking at sharing some of the experiences we had uh, um, in their case with indigenous businesses in our case with uh, with various types of enterprises responding to um, opportunities through multi-day sport event contracts where legacy was a factor 
um, uh, that in, in, in many of the bids to, to host games, you have to describe your legacy. And so there was a, a, an opportunity for value added and that's where social enterprises came in and said, yeah, we, we, you know, if you're gonna construct a games village and, uh, and build sporting facilities, there's an opportunity to create hundred of, hundreds of apprenticeship opportunities for, for young people as you do that construction. There's an opportunity for, for um, uh, a whole different type of engagement to, to leave a strong legacy. So in our world, it built from that. And nowadays we are working with governments um, and some of the early governments involved in Canada, in Scotland, in Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand um, are also talking to each other and sharing with each other. And, you know, it's not easy being the first innovators in the space and um, uh, and changing not just systems and processes and procurement, but changing the culture around procurement, where for decades it was lowest cost um, drove procurement. And now there's something called, you know, social procurement and social value and social impact. And, and how does that rank and how do you set it up? And um, is this legal? Uh, and the number of times we've had to um, have, you know, uh, respond to questions about, um, yes, it's perfectly legal and here's how and here's why and look at this regulation. So, um, latterly, I think many corporates um, uh, um, started to come into social procurement because of the work of social procurement intermediaries and um, engaging with them and Unilever and SAP are two fabulous examples. Um, so we, we, we're on this journey. We are nowhere near a tipping point where at, across governments and, 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 and corporates around the world um, that this is the norm. But we're certainly quite a distance from 15 years ago when every conversation was a really difficult conversation because you were explaining something uh, which was quite alien uh, to people who took a bit of convincing. So I think um, uh, today um, we have an increasing number of, of, of corporates looking at their ability to create social impact by um, procuring products and services and works from social enterprises and an increasing number of governments who recognize that how silly is it to have across a government a range of um, objectives about the well-being um, of your population, about opportunities for young people, about sustainability, and then you go out and you procure on the basis of, of, of lowest cost and, and cheap and cheerful. And there, there's, there's a much more intelligent way to do it, and we're very fortunate to be working with a range of governments on this. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. And, and one of the things I hear, which I want to pick up with our corporate colleagues, is that it's not, it's not intended to necessarily only solve one problem. It's, a, it's essentially a business process that can be applied to a range of different SDGs in our case or, or, or social problems. Um, let me turn first to Alex from um, SAP and ask about what is the commitment that's on the table from SAP? Ambitious, I happen to know what it is, love to hear from you. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about how it came about. You're on mute, I'm afraid. Well, there you go. Somebody has to do it, right? <laughs> and then forget to unmute. <laughs> so that was me. Um, so the commitment that SAP put on the table last year in September was um, a so-called five plus five by 25. And what we mean with that is that we've committed to, um, to divert 5% of our addressable procurement spend towards social enterprises and 5% of our addressable procurement spend towards diverse suppliers by 2025. Um, that's quite, just to, just to give you sort of a bit of a frame what that means, um, you know, we, we think that our addressable spend towards both these categories, social enterprises and diverse suppliers by 2025 can be 60 million US dollars. Um, Unilever is gonna talk about completely different numbers, um, but, but that's a pretty significant um, shift that you can achieve for a spend that is happening in a company anyway. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a sec, but I think what's more interesting as well is how this actually came about and why we're doing this. Um, we've been working in the social enterprise space for the last 10 years. Um, and but frankly, I mean, you guys heard that I head up corporate social responsibility. In the first few years, nobody in the business really cared um, what we were doing with the social enterprise sector, right? It was sort of, okay, CSR is doing that. They believe it's the right thing to do, so let them do it. Um, but the business didn't really, you know, it didn't really 
<clears throat> connect with them. They couldn't really understand why it was important from a business perspective to engage with the social enterprise sector. And, you know, we, we ourselves had also ups and downs, you know, the, one of the first um, social entrepreneurship projects that we did as SAP, I was actually involved in, it was after the earthquake in Haiti, where we were trying to set up a, a, an infrastructure for social business in the country. <clears throat> and it was so overly ambitious and we failed miserably, um, learned a lot in that whole process, but, um, but, through this time, we built up a lot of partnerships with intermediary organizations, incubators, accelerators, network organizations um, that we started to partner with and that we started to learn from in terms of what the opportunities and the potential is. And then two years ago, suddenly it started to click with the business. Um, and there's a very simple reason for it, in my opinion, and that is you know, a few years ago, everybody started talking about the fact that companies need to become more purpose driven um, and that it's it's not just a nice to have anymore, but it's actually a need to have because your stakeholders are demanding it of you. Um, and in that we started, we, we realized that we had an easy way of explaining to our business what a social enterprise is actually is because I didn't understand it before. And we could basically explain to them, look, if we're trying to be purpose driven, look what the social enterprise is doing, because it's part of their DNA. If, if you need a definition of what being purpose driven means, look to a social enterprise. So that's on the click. They go like, OK, that's what they do. Um, but secondly, um, they started seeing that there's business opportunities. And that's where social procurement came in. We learned from our partners in the social enterprise sector about this whole topic of social procurement. And we realized that it's actually a really interesting lever for us um, to, to drive increasing social impact and integrate things more into the business. Um, so it became sort of this clicking point for the business saying, wow, here's finally a way how we can integrate social impact into our business uh, objectives and into our business strategy. How did you know that it clicked? What, what changed? Was there a particular contract or engagement that, that received great acclaim and everybody <clears throat> cheered and popped the champagne in the procurement office? Or like, how, how, <laughs> how was it that demonstrated that there had been this kind of obvious culture shift for you? I think it, uh, we saw it happening, first of all, um, it, it started happening on two levels. We had a board member who, who, who got it. Who, who through her own exposure with, um, with social entrepreneurship um, started to engage much more with, um, with the social enterprise sector. And, um, and she started to learn more about it. And suddenly she understood, wow, this is actually, it's, it actually sounds pretty simple. I mean, putting it into practice is not simple at all, right? But the business case in itself is actually quite simple. Um, so that was one component. So there was actually things happening at the top. Um, but then we also, we had a few, and I think Alex can speak to that as well. We just had a few really passionate people within the organization who believed in it and who knew that this could be a significant change. Um, and we basically just started driving it from the middle out. And it's those few people who started to create a ripple effect in the organization that is just snowballing now. Um, and that's basically what happened. Great, thanks. Yeah, let's hear from Alex P from Unilever, her, her experience, your, your corporate experience. So from the from more from the procurement side, it sounds like. What 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 is the what is the commitment, first of all? And um and how did it come about? Yeah, no, so so Unilever have, have, have announced back in January a set of eight social commitments, uh, in which two, which which I would say are probably the two key ones. Uh, sit with procurement, and indeed, we, we are in charge of this commitment, which already it's, it's having it's, it's a change in say, but it's absolutely embedded into our compass strategy. So it's it's a company program. So we announced two very ambitious commitments. One is to um, ensure that everyone that provide goods and services to Unilever will be paid a minimum of a living wage or living income by 2030. Uh, and because it was not enough, we also announced that we will achieve a two billion spend with diverse businesses by 2025. Um, and, and we, I'm in charge of that. And that's how I've become 
responsible for social procurement. Uh, so you can imagine these are bold and big commitments, but I'm absolutely proud that we did that and that we did that in procurement. I mean, I, I'm a procurement person. I spend all my life in procurement and many of my friends, colleagues, family will serve it. Is this really a procurement task? And, and I'm resonating a lot with what Gary and Alex said. It, it is because it's, it's an opportunity for us uh, in procurement to drive impact. And look, yeah, it's positive impact to people. Absolutely, yes, it's why we do it. But there is a business impact. And I, I really agree with Alex a lot. Uh, there is business impact. And we saw it with, you know, from the basic example of the company you bring because you really wanted to proactively attract diverse businesses with all the essence of the big D. And you finally find, you know, the magic uh, solution or the magic supplier that is more agile have a better proposition and at the end you save money. And yes, I also tick my boss that yeah, it's, it's even turning to be a, a better option. But it come you know, much longer and probably we are fortunate to be in consumer goods because we, I fundamentally believe and I'm lucky that we all fundamentally believe at Unilever that this is something the consumer wants. And indeed, we also believe that the younger consumer will not give us a chance. So when people ask me, what's the cost of doing it? We tend to say, what's the cost of not doing it? And I fundamentally believe that if we don't do it, we will lose consumer. And by doing also something that increases revenue and wage of people, we're creating new consumer. And at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, what we are selling is soap and soup. So it's basic product that people will buy when they have the money to buy it. You hit on this this thing that I think takes down one of the, the main myths of the sort of the, the integration of social into some business decision, which is that it requires trade-offs. And obviously the fact that we're highlighting your two companies and maybe there, and Jerry will tell us later how many others big corporations are out there making similar commitments. So maybe the answer is a couple, maybe the answer is tons and I hadn't heard of them. <laughs> Seems to me more likely the answer is not as many. So the perception that this is still involves some sort of trade-off is out there and probably acts in a, as an obstacle for the, for the businesses. Alex T, you're saying it doesn't in fact this help you make money. Um, in what cases is that True. Sort of aside from obviously the, the fact that you're building through living wage new new suppliers. In, when you're choosing a diverse set of suppliers, what is the what is the mechanism there that is turning into improved revenue? And I guess also if you can explain that, and then also to what extent is that replicable in other companies? Yeah. So so look. Um, first, I really think Unilever is late to the party. I think many companies have put commitment for supply diversity. I mean, we are very advanced on living wage, but on supply diversity, I think many companies have put commitment out where I think we are making or trying to make a difference. And that's why also we're coming here with Alex and we've been talking, we are partnering a lot with others. And I do really believe that partnership in, in, in the sense of we will help this company to try to develop and to be ready to the corporate. Because what we heard, and I think Jerry said that, one of the challenges is access to corporate with all the sets of access to corporate. And, and so we in corporate procurement needs to also become different in the way we source, we get connected to this company and also be conscious that the way to enter such big corporation as ourselves is not always easy, especially if you are a two or three person company just starting. So this has required and still required us to work a lot on the mindset of the people and get these few passionate people that will make it happen. But when we do it, and we want to do it in our processes because I don't want to bring a diverse company because they are diverse. I just want to make sure that when procurement is looking for a supplier, they always try to include also diverse businesses. And I firmly believe that these businesses in some case will win because they just have a better proposition all in thing, all things together. And we're having an example in, in the US, in South Africa, where we've been having a program for a couple of years. We started in the UK this year, already having fabulous example of few uh, you know, small diverse businesses we have bring in mainly in the marketing space, where they bring new idea and new way of connecting with consumer. So, so we will bring them because they have a good proposition, not because they are diverse. Okay. I, I, and I want to I want to come in a second to that the question of sort of how do we best create the, the links and the partnerships and what sort of criteria and diligence. But for the moment, Alex from SAP, does that jibe with your experience as well that that this is essentially in the end just good business in addition to being um, somehow impactful? And, and, and are there not trade-offs? And if so, what are those trade-offs? 
Look, I think ultimately, if you look at it just purely from a products and services perspective, I actually don't think that there is a lot of trade-offs there. Um, and as Alex said, I think to the contrary, I think if you if you have two companies with the same product that you can buy from, right, and one has an additional value proposition attached to it, um, whatever that value proposition is, um, be it from a social impact perspective or environmental impact perspective, the way that buying behavior is moving these days, I think you will probably see that people will tend towards buy, towards buying from the company that offers the product with an added value, right? So there, that there's, I don't really, I don't really see that there's a trade-off there. And frequently, our experiences in working with social enterprises that, you know, from a quality perspective, uh, from a price perspective, they can offer exactly the same as any other company there is a but. <laughs> um, and the but is more that um, I think you cannot come into this as a company thinking that, oh, you're just going to invest in social procurement now. You're just going to change buying behavior. You're going to build all these relationships and bring social enterprises and suppliers into your supply chain, and then you're done. Um, the, 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 the investment is larger than that, right? Because actually, what, what needs to happen is a lot of investment in infrastructure and network and sector building and ca capability building within social enterprises. And I think that as a corporate, if you, if you are willing to enter the social procurement space, you also need to be willing to make that more foundational investment, so to speak, <laughs> to ensure that um, the the demand that you're generating can actually be met by the supply. Can you give me an example of the the some of the a piece of the infrastructure that you focused on building and 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I it's I mean it is very simple, right? It has a lot to do with capacity building for social enterprises. I mean, you can't expect. Um, social enterprises or diverse suppliers to just be corporate ready, right? And to know exactly what what it means and what how they need to behave and what they need to do in order to uh, to build a relate a buying relationship and a selling relationship with a corporate. Um, there is there's just some capability and capacity building that needs to happen. So one of the things that we're doing is investing in in programs like Esgrit, for example, that we're driving together with Moving Worlds. Um, that looks specifically at how to help companies, social enterprises that want to be embedded in the corporate supply chain, how to help them with the, the social selling, right? With the building the right value proposition, um, you know, responding in the right way to an RFP. Um, and all these little things that you might not be thinking about, but that need attention. Um, and these are things that we're trying to sort of build through programs like Esgrid, give this kind of capacity building to social enterprises so that we can push them along to be corporate ready, maybe a little bit faster than trying to have to figure it out all by themselves. Thanks. Um, Jerry, to you, a, a version of that question, then Alex, Alex T will come to you with that as well. And to what extent do you think that the, the folks who are around the table at the Social Enterprise World Forum um, are corporate ready? To what extent are they able to uh, sort of accept or or secure the opportunities that at least these two companies are presenting to themselves? To them? Okay, Dan, if you don't mind, before I answer that, the, the the previous in the previous question, you 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 mentioned you you asked whether corporates are ready around the world, um, or is is it just a handful? And the answer is that it's very very uneven at the moment. In in some places, um, there are. Uh, every month there are corporates coming on to uh, to change the relationship with social enterprise from CSR to procurement and from a social enterprise perspective um, it is generally speaking a more sustainable and progressive and less benevolent relationship if you're selling your services um, 
uh, to uh, a company than if you're if you're in receipt of support from CSR. CSR is very valuable, and in many cases, it's the first relationship that a social enterprise will have with a company. Um, but it's a it's definitely a more sustainable and better position um, if you're in the supply chain because uh, that has huge potential. Where CSR, by its nature, uh, will, will will be capped and limited. And you know we're working with GNG, with Shandos, with Linklaters, with PwC. There are a whole range of of um, uh, of corporates who are taking this on um, and we frequently get requests about can you introduce us to social enterprises in this continent this country because we want to extend our work there and that's what we're doing with social enterprise intermediaries to tackle that but i guess the the the, the question you then asked about whether social enterprises are ready many are many are ready right now i mean if you if you think in your context in the usa the supportive business sector um, or affirmative enterprises, the social enterprises that were established many decades ago working with people with disabilities. And um, they've been supplying the public sector, in your case, the, the police services, the, the health service, the FBI um, uh, across Europe. And, and, and um, it, it's similar, they're supplying protective clothing, um, equipment, uh, a whole range of things where people with disabilities are, are generally involved in manufacturing. And um, they could never get a look in, usually with the corporate sector, um, uh, but uh, the, the public sector was where they first got their opportunities. Well, they can absolutely, um, they are business ready if corporates want to look at the ability to source um, uh, services um, from the sector. Uh, we have others that in recent years, you know, Wild Hearts for Stationery can compete with other stationery and document archi archiving providers in the UK. But when you purchase your stationery from Wild Hearts, you're assisting um, teenage girls to continue their education in Southern Africa, and you're um, assisting school kids to be involved in social entrepreneurship programs. If you are working on uh, if, if your business requires software testing and systems testing and the um, uh, groups like Specialist Learn and Auticon will work with um, and engage and, and put uh, people with autism uh, in your company to carry out the task on a, a very, very competitive basis because of the skill sets that um, people have. And this is hugely um, popular and expanding and it's popular in corporates because um, it's recognized to have a value way beyond the act, the act of procurement and the value of the procurement. It, it motivates staff uh, and, and teams. It, it helps to recruit and retain people. It, 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 it motivates people around their work. Um, so some of the trade-off cost I would counter for, for, for a corporate um, is about, well, how are you going to attract the best talent into your organization and retain it in your organization? And one of the ways that you can become um, a good business um, is by extracting maximum value from your procurement. Um, so social enterprises are increasingly getting ready. And I would ask corporates um, uh, whether they can consider um, some contracts being local and not being um, at the, the highest possible value covering the largest possible geography. Because if you can allow for local um, uh, contracting and tendering where there's a clear potential local value to be generated, um, uh, that can work. And also, can you um, uh, are you structured to allow consortia um, of social enterprises to bid? Um, because sometimes just the system says, no, you can't be a, a, a consortium of social enterprises, um, is, is missing a huge opportunity. And uh, in, in Scotland, the Community Reuse Network um, uh, formed a, a procurement consortium with 50 social enterprises that are engaged in provision of reuse services. And they have won a significant number of contracts in the last two years, none of which would have been won by the individual social enterprises because they were too small. Similarly, in, in Ethiopia, Social Enterprise Ethiopia um, got together um, over 40 of its members um, in, the, in the teeth of the COVID response um, to provide a whole range of services from PPE to ambulance services um, in a contract with government. And that was, um, again, that would have been beyond the capacity of most of those social enterprises, but collectively. So there's a whole range of ways of making sure this can happen. Great, thank you for the specific examples. Let me turn uh, Alex T from Unilever. Uh, any reactions in general to to what your your co-panelists were just talking about? But then I'm really eager that we move in the direction of like, 
okay, how can we best provide the opportunities to, how can we reach the social entrepreneurs we wanna work with? How can we best support them so that they can be successful much in the, in the way that, that Jerry was just pointing out? Yeah, no, just a just few things. So having on, on what Gay was saying, um, I think it's key, so what we call the ecosystem, and I know it's a buzzword, but it's what it is. I mean, I, we really believe that indeed very often it will not be only, you know, a, a social enterprise or, or, or a small business. Uh, maybe they need to work in an ecosystem with our bigger supplier or supplier that are able to scale. So I, I, I absolutely agree with Gary that this idea of consortium or making, you know, the connection with more than one and us being just ready to engage with more than one, uh, it is important. On the same spirit, I do believe that this is not really a competing space. So we are working also a lot with you know, our peers, our competitors in, in sharing information about the, the good social enterprise, making the connection. Because you know, the question about are social enterprises ready to cooperate? Sometimes my question is, are we in corporate ready to social enterprise? And I want to be very humble here because I spend my life in corporate. You know, I'm lucky to talk to people that spend their life in social enterprise. And sometimes I think it's, 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 it's a pro problem in both sides. So it is also how we educate our people uh, in, in understanding what social enterprise is. And I can tell you, it's not what I grew up with. It's quite a, you know, it's a year and a half on that space. And you realize how complicated it is for a very small enterprise to onboard a corporate like us. So it's both sides. And I also want to say back to Gary and Alex point, it is also very market specific. So yes, we have commit for a global commitment, but we're going really market by market because it, the reality is so different from one market to another, which lead me to your point about how do we help this company? First, we, we go country by country. We work with intermediary and experts because we're not experts to understand what this group needs. And you know what they need in Kenya is very different to what they need in Thailand or in the UK. So we've been partnering with many organizations one of the best examples I have is the partnership we're doing with Transform, which some of you will have heard, which it's a private public partnership, you know, with Unilever, Aston Young and, and the government in the UK. And we're really trying to work together to support social enterprise that are doing something also that is doing positive impact to the, to the planet in, in country where, you know, they require development. So, so all these things just need to become the, the snowball and continue to be, um, you know, the solution. But I really want to be, emphasizing. I think we have as much as a problem to say small social enterprises are not ready to cooperate, to say corporate procurement is probably not yet ready to that because for many procurement people that's not what you've been trained or, or used to. It's a strange animal and many procurement people need to get used also to, you know, the norm is not to do a 10 million contract with a global supplier uh, and that requires a lot of change. So, so there's a, a great, awesome, and, and in particular, we'll, we'll pick up on that in a second to Isha's question in the chat, and there's a couple of other from David and from Philippe as well, but, but be as practical as you can, whoever would like to answer this. What should social enterprises who are listening to this live or on, or on tape next uh, do to make, put themselves in the best position to meet, to potentially get contracts that can be, from their perspective, transformational in terms of their business and in terms of their impact? It's a sort of a simple version of what is obviously a complex conversation with them, but but it, but feel free to answer it any way you want, and we'll maybe start with Alex, VDP. Um, oh God, there's so many things, right? Um, but but I think building on what Alex was saying, this all takes time, right? None of this happens overnight. Both from a social enterprise perspective and also from a corporate perspective. And frankly, we're doing the same thing as, as Unilever is doing it too, is basically going country by country, market by market, um, which is a challenge in itself as well, because there's only so fast you can go <laughs> by taking that approach. Um, but I think one advice that I ha would have is, is find your, find your ecosystem and your network. Um, so find the, the, organizations that you can work with, be it the intermediaries that can make the connection to the corporates, um, or be it other social enterprises that are working in similar spaces as you, as Jerry was saying that, you know, sometimes you have to actually come together, come together as a collective and as a consortium rather than going by yourself. So you really have to look at your ecosystem and get to know your ecosystem really well. So I think that's, that's one. The other thing is that um, a very practical thing is to get your brand established on 
on procurement and networking ecosystems. Um, and one of them, and this is going to sound like a like a bit of a plug for SAP, but um, but there is, you know, we do run one of the biggest marketplaces <laughs> called SAP Ariba. Um, but there's others, right? Um, I see Amanda from from Group Markets on on this call. Um, they they have a fantastic platform as well. So make sure you establish your brand on procurement platforms like that. So look for them. Make sure that you're um, that you're on it. Um, and then sort of when when it comes to working with companies, I think there's two things. One is be very clear about your value proposition. What is it that makes you unique? And how do you how do you position that um, towards the corporate? Um, and then spend quite a bit of time trying to find the right person in a company. And my God, that's difficult in a, in a multinational like, like Unilever or SAP. And I'm, I'm really aware of that. But I think that's where the intermediaries can help as well, because they often have the contacts <clears throat> into the corporate sector. They work closely with the companies as well. So they will know, is it better at Unilever, for example, to, um, to start the conversation with procurement or is it maybe better in SAP to start the conversation with CSR? Um, and that can really vary depending on the company's approach towards social procurement. Um, so those are just some of the some of the tips that I would have. And, and Jerry, let me get your sense of that. Obviously, the, 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 one of the questions, one of the answers to the question, how might be, hey, connect with Social Enterprise World Forum. Fair enough. Uh, what, what specific advice might you give to folks around the table who want to make this um, a part of their Part of their work? I guess it partly depends on um, uh, on the position they consider themselves to be in at the moment. If they feel that they need support because they aren't ready to invest in corporate tenders and potentially lose three to get one, um, then as Alex said, um, engage with intermediaries. Um, places, uh, platforms like Good Market um, are, are outstanding in 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 terms of the, the the support and the understanding there. And in a whole range of countries, I mean, the bi social movement is growing exponentially. And um, uh, you know, it's across the USA and Canada, um, parts of Europe and, and and around the world. And and there are others um, not doing bi social. The one with the best name by some distance is in Malaysia where the, the, the division of the ministry responsible for social procurement and certifying social enterprises is called magic. So take that, Harry Potter. Um, so um, there's a lot of work happening around certification, around readiness, around training. Um, on the SCWF site, um, there's recordings from our policy forum, which took place last week. 50% um, of the sessions during the policy forum were on social procurement. Um, and um, from our event last year, um, five of the top seven sessions by numbers of playback were on social procurement. We thought it would be the inspirational, motivational, um, uh, change the world sessions, but actually it was the community benefit clause workshop and the how social procurement works and how it doesn't. So we have information um, uh, um, li like that as well. So there, there are a whole range of sources for information um, if you feel that you... Um, you, you would benefit from that. Uh, one thing for some social enterprises who over a number of years may have got used to tendering um, on the basis of here's the product or here's the service, full stop. They would not have described the social impact because they would not have been treated as a serious business. That is the culture that existed three to five years ago. Work out which of your potential buyers may not actually be in that position now where they may not have procured for you in the past, um, but actually uh, they may do if you articulate your social impact strongly. Great. I mean, Alex T, maybe over to you, obviously any reactions welcome, but then there's also some questions that relate to, to something you were touching on, which is kind of that you, you need to help the corporates get better at this in order to be ready for the social enterprises. Um, David mentioned in particular, uh, you know, we're moving from sort of a risk avoidance or risk mitigation strategy to something that's probably more embracing of risk. Um, and Philippe wonders whether that has something to do with kind of where procurement sits. Now social procurement is, it's in procurement. Used, a lot of this used to happen outside kind of in CSR. Um, how, does, how does this all sound to you? What, what, what reactions do you have in, in particular such that we can best situate your corporate partners and, and those in the social enterprise space um, to be yeah. successful? 
Look, so first I agree with what Alex and Gary said. So I think this is probably are, are the same advice I will give. Uh, plus I would say, and I'm always careful when I say that because it come back to me, but it's good. Sometimes if you really convince, just with chat as well. I have many people just re reaching out, you know, via, via LinkedIn. Sometimes you have to, to bypass kind of the process and try to just connect with someone because as Alex said, it's big corporate and, and just, you know, do a bit of, of, of selling pitch. Yeah, sometimes it's annoying. Sometimes you will get nowhere, but maybe you know, one of 10 get you to somewhere. And we had, a, we, we had a good example that I can't really share, but this is how it happened. It just happened, we had a connection that the company was really, really, you know, uh, persistent and I think something will happen. So, so it's, it's sometimes also that. And, and maybe my first reaction was like, well, just another social enterprise reaching out to me now. But, you know, it, it's, 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 it's me and my team that when we foresee that there is something, we, we go for it. And as Gary said, I agree that today procurement will look twice about it because we all know that there is a proposition which is, you know, beyond that. Uh, in regards to where we sit, I am very key, and for me, it's absolutely fundamental that we sit in procurement. And I would not be sitting anywhere than in procurement, and I'm probably also doing that job because I'm a procurement baby, you know, if you want. So it gives you a lot of credibility and understanding. And for me, it's absolutely powerful that, you know, my boss, which is the chief procurement officer, my boss boss, which is the chief supply chain officer, are responsible for this commitment. And I think that makes a big difference. Because, you know, and let's be very basic, if I look at my KPIs or my procurement KPIs, it is part of the KPIs. So yes, it's about cost and cash and service and quality, but it's also about sustainability and social. And that's for me, it's absolutely fundamental and make a big difference that if it was a CSR target, and then I'm just here to deliver against a target which is not mine you know at the end of the day people tend to be quite basic to what is my target and this is absolutely powerful so i think for me it's, it's super and, and if you are about to start a journey there is one thing i would say even before you fight for resource fight for that fight for the fact that this has to be part of a broader set of kpis because we all know that this is helping you to drive now some people passionate will do it whatever but it's helping and to be also very concrete, what this means is that we are now looking at integrating social procurement into our contract review, our sourcing strategy review. So when a buyer will come and say, oh, I have a new sourcing or strategy, we will also ask them, okay, what about social procurement? If you think about you know, what it means for social enterprise, for diverse supplier, what about living wage commitment? And very conscious at the beginning, people will be like, I have no idea, never think about it. But then it become like, you know, it become an habitude for people. And, and that's, I think, where uh, I'm with Alex, it will take time, but we are really creating, I think, something that becomes just, just normal. Like when you were asking people to do e-tender 15 years ago, you know, the first time you were asking for Kevin to do e-tender, they were like, well, I never did it. Now we're asking them to think about social procurement. That's great. Is, I mean, is that for any of you? Is there where is the where is the institution that corporates should engage with that is that is going to help them learn how to do this and make it make it easier? I mean, is it is there someone that we at Catalyst can start to create a relationship with? And so someone had a conversation. Jerry, are you already doing this kind of on a more systematic basis and outreach with with corporates to help them learn how? That would be um, overstating it. Um, because of our size, but we are working with um, a range of social enterprise and social procurement intermediaries um, uh, on, uh, on most continents just now to, uh, to be able to respond to, to this increasing corporate demand and interest. So, you know, our partnerships with groups like Good Market, World Fair Trade Organization, the Bisocial Movement, Arkina in, in New Zealand, Social Traders in Australia, Magic Malaysia, um, uh, and our our attempt at getting folk together on the one platform on this is, is, is our newly launched social procurement community of practice, uh, which is on the SEWF site. And it has at the moment three target audiences. One is the social procurement intermediaries that we've been working with for, for in many, in some cases, many years, uh, but giving the intermediaries a space and place to share experiences, systems, techniques, um, and stories. Um, and the other two groupings are public sector procurement commissioners and officials, um, and corporate sector um, uh, procurement officials and those who are involved in, in, in social procurement across the, the corporates. So um, each has their own space for uh, for discussion, uh, accepting that some people will have a lot of experience, others would be very, very new to this. And uh, this is our way of, of um, having um, honest and direct 
uh, uh, dialogue um, uh, with, with people who are who are involved in this space. Alex, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I don't think there is like with many issues in the world there's unfortunately never just that one place where you can go and you find all of the resources and all of the information that you need. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, next to what Jerry was uh, was outlining in terms of the work that they're doing at SEWF, um, we see um, that, you know, for example, the COVID-19 Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs, um, a large part of the work in the corporate cluster is around social procurement. Um, and obviously that then also talks about you know, how do you enable corporates um, to engage in social procurement? But I think you should also not underestimate sort of the, what happens or the, the, the impact that you can have as an individual company on other companies by role modeling and by putting the practice together first and sharing information and sharing knowledge and know-how, right? Um, when we when when big multinationals like SAP or Unilever decide to do something like this, it has a ripple effect automatically because you you typically also you don't always procure directly from social enterprises either. You have multiple layers potentially sitting in between, like tier one suppliers and I don't know how many other tiers you've got. Um, so if you saying that you're going to change your procurement guidelines and policies and practices, it automatically has an, has an effect on, on your entire supply chain. And that reaches multiple corporates and multiple companies. Um, I think that's one. Um, and the other thing, you know, for us as well, when, when we started embarking on this journey of social procurement, we were very clear as well that this is not just about us and about changing how we want to procure, um, but we also, because we're a technology company, we also see it as an opportunity to enable our customers to reach their targets in terms of diverse supplier. And you heard Alex say this, you know, they have a massive target when it comes to this, but um, we did some research ourselves um, in this and there's over 50% of procurement um, officials today say that they need to diversify their supply chain. That's massive, that's a huge number. So they might not have all of the answers yet, they might not have gotten started, but they know they have to and they need to get going. Um, so I think that, that through efforts like that and also through companies just working together and as I said, sharing know-how, but potentially also going further than that and actually collaborating with each other in this space. Um, there's a lot that you can do to enable other companies to do the same. We're getting toward the end and question, not that many more questions will come in, one of, one of which will prompt my sort of final shaping before we come back to everybody for a last thought. And, and the shaping is sort of how do we go from I want to say this in a really nice way. Like 5% is great, 60 million is a lot, 2 billion is a lot. It's also obviously only 120th of the overall procurement and some other percentage. And I read um, Alex T that, you know, the, the 2 billion is a seven fold increase. These are massive shifts. And yet we're also still talking about kind of partial. How do we go from where we are now, which is again, substantial change and that, that amount of spend and the and the um, from both multinationals and Jerry the, the the range of the networks and the intermediaries, it's truly transformative for those institutions, those social enterprises, and certainly for their beneficiaries, their participants, their employees. But there's this massive other like chunk, right? There's this huge out there. Um, we at Catalyst, in particular, want to want to accelerate change. Um, one of the question piece of it is to what extent is governmental regulation really vital here? And Jerry, you you hinted already that obviously enabling legislation somehow that's, that's focused um, public procurement on the social outcomes. But in the corporate side, blankly, how do we go from where we are now, substantial as it is, to, to yet more doubling, tripling, quadrupling, or getting to where it's essentially 100%. What role does regulation play? What role does collaboration play? What role does advocacy play? What role does, do sort of mistakes play? Thoughts about that from anyone who wants to hazard a, hazard a response. Look, I, I, if I can go, I think, yeah, I mean, governance for me play a key role. If I look at supply diversity specifically, I think the position, for example, South Africa took, I mean, 
a player a big role. But but I also think, and I'm just really going on what Alex was saying, co- collaboration is fundamental and partnership is fundamental. So, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because if I look at Unilever, for example, yeah, you know, we're we, we having, you know, what, 35 billion spent. The reality is that majority of that spent is in areas such as chemical and packaging and ingredients where it's not necessarily where traditionally, you know, small enterprise, social enterprise, diverse businesses are, are in. And, and if I really want to do a big shift and finally have, I don't know, 5 billion going in one year, I need to develop company in, in chemical, for example. And, and this is where magic could happen to use magic again. We know as per our clean future announcement and like many other company in chemical industry, we need to move out from fossil fuel. You know, we need to go to green fuel, all of us in the world because we can't just continue. So we know that to do that, we need to create a full set of new product, new technology, new service, and new supplier, or at least company needs to change and develop. So the only way we can really probably do this big shift is that we all come together and we help because you also need to help company to scale with access to funds, capability, and so on and so forth. You develop the, 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 you know, the, 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 the big company of tomorrow that will be a social enterprise, will be hopefully you know, by an underrepresented group doing good for everybody. And that's where the big shift will happen. Otherwise, I mean, we will always be stuck in corporate, but even in government, I would say, to only certain bucket of spend. And I think this is where even the best in class company in the US that have been doing super diversity for 20 years are probably coming to a kind of a plateau. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I want to say, which go back to the government and the advocacy, is that we also need to think as a, as a corporate world and as a world about rethinking some of the criteria. You know, for example, when we talk about 51% of ownership, control, and management to define a diverse businesses, probably long-term, we will need to think about something different to allow this company to grow. And so, so that will require time. Uh, that's why having this big shift into like 80% of our spend being with social and diverse will probably not happen before a long time, unfortunately. Thanks, Alex. Go to you, and then and then we'll leave the last couple of minutes for Jerry um, on the same sort of question. How do we go from where we are now to to, what, to to the scale that we really need in order to achieve the SDGs? You know, building on what Alex was saying, that I mean, I I, I completely agree that sort of you know diversifying the majority of your spend is going to be hard, but. Um, but still, I think that the, that the percentage of what each company can diversify is, is pretty significant in itself per company, but that adds up, right? If you, if you can create this snowball effect that, um, that, you know, when I was saying earlier that 50% of procurement um, officers have a target of needing to diversify, um, I mean, if they all follow through with that, um, your pl- the plateau that is certainly there is actually at a very high level. <laughs> so it, it will take us quite a while to get there. And in that, we will have generated so much funding that goes purely into social impact and environmental impact as we've never had before, right? So, so I just wanna say that even if the percentages don't sound that big, um, that the more companies participate, um, the more we see that shift happening, um, the more you see that it is actually quite a significant amount that can be, uh, that can be shifted. I mean, just I'll give you just one example in the German market, right? Um, the, um, the addressable spend amongst DAX companies is at 50 billion annually. That's just one market, um, 50 billion, the German market, the, DAX, the, the top DAX companies could generate 30, 50 billion of um, diverse and social procurement spend um, in one market alone. It's certainly, um, right, certainly, certainly massively impactful, yeah. even if it's only that much, right? Let yeah. me we'll just squeeze in Jerry for a 60 second sort of final reflection as well on, on how, do we, how do we continue to build on the, the great, genuinely great progress that is, is represented here and the, and the really significant potential for, for social enterprises. I think the government role is significant. Regulation is important. Um, uh, in, in our own context here in Scotland, um, the Scottish government through the Procurement Reform Act in 2014 uh, insisted that all government procurement needed to take account of sustainability. So they 
every government department needs to publish a year in advance the procurement that it, it, it intends uh, to make so that in the case of social enterprises, they get a year's notice potentially of, of, of a contract and they need to report on the sustainability. It's no longer legal to award a contract on the basis of lowest cost. And in the last year that, that was measured, 287 million pounds, which is more than 5% of regulated procurement uh, was, was spent with social enterprises. And you know, this is an issue of balance and readiness. If a company wanted to go to 50% uh, instead of a target of 5% just now, in many cases, the social enterprise sector will not be ready for that. Yeah. Um, so these things need to be in balance. So when I see uh, companies like Unilever and SAP committing to significant amounts, that's absolutely fabulous and it will help others to take notice, to also join. And in these steps that we take together, social enterprises will build capacity. We will all share what's working and we we'll give encouragement to social enterprises to grow and to expand horizontally and vertically. And the amount of spend will increase incrementally. And that's absolutely a win-win for everybody. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, it's fantastic. I find myself both informed by your experience and also motivated to to make uh, to make them better known and to ensure that the snowball really does happen. This tremendous um, progress from SAP and from Unilever, the commitments are valuable and worthwhile. The ways you've navigated to get them to where they're really concrete is extraordinary. The way in which you're going to work with um, with the Social Enterprise World Forum to to sort of highlight the opportunities and Jerry, the way in which you're building uh, the, the the local networks that are necessary for the social enterprises to interact with. It's inspirational and it's seems to have such tremendous practical value in terms of impact. Um, really grateful to the work you're doing, grateful that you've participated in Catalyst 2030. Uh, those of you who've been listening at home in your home offices, thank you for taking the time with us. Um, there's some stuff in the chat for you to react to. Um, let us know how this was, join us, uh, send me a note, send Deepa a note, our co-chairs of Working Group 7, which is focused on promoting opportunities for the private sector to work with social entrepreneurs, very much on target here. Um, again, Jerry and Alex and Alex, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in person at some point soon, I hope. Everybody in the meantime, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thanks so Thanks much. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.